There was a song in the 80s by the Talking Heads called Once in a Lifetime. And uh, it's a very metaphorical song. It's a metaphor for modern life and the frustrations of it and the depths of our unconscious and, and what that drives us to. But there was a line there that I like, how did I get here? And then he repeats that line, same as it ever was, same as it ever was. And as I was preparing this, I, that I was thinking about that song. Um, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm putting in a little bit bigger context than a personal life. I'm putting it in a context of uh, why are we here? How did we get here? I want to assert that contrary to much current thought, we may in fact not be the unhappy accident of unguided natural processes. There is a mounting body of scientific evidence which argues against the likelihood that the complexity that we see, even in a single cell, came about by sheer random chance. Now, it's not the purpose of this book to address this body of evidence or to make a scientific case for the existence of God, However, to make sense of why biblical teaching actually matters to our species today, I found it helpful to contrast these two seemingly separate approaches to understand our existence and our experience. John Lennox put it really well in the introduction to Seven Days That Divide the World. There are many Christians who, like me, are convinced of the inspiration and authority of Scripture and have spent their lives actively engaged in science. We think that since God is the author of Scripture, the Bible, and the universe, there must ultimately be harmony between correct interpretation of the biblical data and correct interpretation of the scientific data. He continues a little later. We cannot keep science and scripture completely separate for the simple reason that the Bible talks about some of the things that science talks about. They are important things, like the origin of the universe and life, and they are foundational both to science and philosophy. Now, and I, and I like John. He's, he's done a lot of good work. I've read some of his books. Some scientists, like Jay Gould of Harvard University, they like to insist that science and religion are both valid, but deal with different matters. And I suspect in so doing, he's likely masking a very common underlying belief that science deals with the real world, and religion the world of literature and fantasy, populated by characters like Zeus, the Easter Bunny, and God, that kindly man upstairs. But it is becoming increasingly difficult to keep the domain of science and biblical studies discreet, as some would greatly prefer. Yet as we gain more understanding of the physical aspects of our immediate surroundings in the cosmos, more questions arise. Let's take the case of water. Biologist Michael Denton asks, why is water the single most pervasive liquid on the planet? Now, Leonardo da Vinci called water the driving force of all nature. It is the only substance which expands and becomes less dense when it becomes a solid. Now, it turns out this is essential to life. Here's why. Ice floats on the surface of bodies of water as the temperature drops below freezing. But as any Minnesotan will tell you, fishing is good in the winter. Now, if ice didn't float as it froze, it would sink to the bottom of the lake or pond and pile up until no liquid water remained. This would end up freezing every living thing in the body of water. Now, this is not to mention, taking the, the bigger scope, the impact on the weather cycle is eventually all the water on the planet would freeze and this would turn 
and would in turn lower the ambient temperature and make life impossible, ultimately. Water stabilizes our atmosphere and maintains it in a livable temperature range. Water's properties seem to uniquely suited to support life on this planet. And one of its other thermal properties is its high efficiency for evaporative cooling. As it turns out, it's also essential to humans in particular. Our bodies produce a lot of heat. We, just have, we have skin, we don't have fur or anything like that. So that heat has to be discharged. Sweat is a very efficient means of doing this. If this wasn't the case, we'd overheat and die. Especially when the ambient temperature exceeds our internal body temperature of 98 degrees. Sweating also allows us to remain active more of the time, unlike other mammals. There's more. Water is also a universal solvent. Yet unlike most other solvents, it isn't chemically reactive. This makes it the ideal car carrier for many of the chemicals and minerals needed for life by nearly every living thing on the earth. Water is also essential to life because of its viscosity. If it were even a little less viscous, the delicate microscopic structures in living cells would collapse. If its viscosity were even a little higher, circulation into the tiny capillaries which supply blood to living organs wouldn't be possible either. So here's the thing. Water didn't evolve. The nature of water gets traced back to the inception of time and space in a singularity which current scientific thinking terms the Big Bang. The excruciatingly precise tolerance thought to have been established at that first moment include the volumes of matter, quantities of energy, and laws of physics. The theory of, of such a singularity isn't proven yet, but much evidence points in that direction and there are several competing theories which collectively address this question. But the implication is that Water was there from the start. Water is only one example of the extreme fine-tuning of our natural environment that permits life to exist. I'm not going to go into those, but I'll, I'll kind of sum that up with what Freeman Dyson said. Uh, he's a very well-known physicist, for those of you who follow physics. <laughs> if you don't, look him up. Anyway, as we look out into the universe and identify the many accidents of physics and astronomy that have worked together to our benefit, it almost seems as if the universe must in some sense have known we were coming. What I like about this statement is that he recognizes an order of things which he does not pretend to fully understand, but which he is too honest to dismiss. Hard peer-reviewed science continues to point in this direction, and the tide of thought is beginning to change. There is a grandeur in this view of life with its several powers, having been originally breathed by the Creator into a few forms or into one. While this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. These are the final sentences in Darwin's Origin of Species, published in 1859. Naturalist Charles Darwin is the best-known proponent of the theory that life evolved on the basis of random, unguided natural forces. He didn't start out that way. In 1831, Darwin was 22 years old. He recently graduated from college and wanted to explore the ecosystems of the world. So at the encouragement of his uh, botany professor, John Henslow at Cambridge, he joined the expedition of the HMS Beagle. Two months into the voyage around the world, he was walking in the midst of a Brazilian rainforest. Confronted by the beauty, Darwin later recounts in his journal in 1839, Among the scenes which are deeply impressed on my mind, none exceeds the sublimity 
of the primeval forest undefaced by the hand of man, whether those of Brazil, where the powers of life are predominant, or those of Tierra del Fuego, where death and decay prevail. Both are temples filled with the various productions of the God of nature. No one can stand in these solitudes unmoved and not feel that there is more in man than the mere breath in his body. Darwin's sense of awe about nature and about human beings did not last. Fast forward to the ending chapter of his life, as he wrote his autobiography, reflecting on earlier sense of awe in that rainforest, Darwin wrote that now not even the grandest scenes in nature would inspire such a view. Why? Well, he explained that the evidence of exquisite design and purpose that he once saw in nature failed now that he discovered his law of natural selection. I have a suspicion, though, that there is another question, one which troubles a lot of people uh, in science and in other areas, one that he could not come to terms with. I'll put it in his words. With respect to the theological view of the question, it is always painful to me. I am bewildered. I had no intention to write atheistically, but I own that I cannot see as plainly as others do, and as I should wish to do, evidence of design and beneficence on all sides. There seems to me to be too much misery in the world. I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created a parasitic wasp with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars, or that a cat should play with mice. Not believing this, I see no necessity in the belief that the eye was expressly designed. On the other hand, I cannot anyhow be contented to view this wonderful universe and especially the nature of man and to conclude that everything is the result of brute force. I'm inclined to look at everything as resulting from designed laws with the details, whether good or bad, left to the working out of what we may call chance. Not that this notion satisfies me. I feel most deeply that the whole subject is too profound for the human intellect. Dog might as well speculate on the mind of Newton. Let each man hope and believe what he can. Now, as King David observed in the 139th Psalm, he said something very similar. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. David and Darwin arrived at a similar conclusion about truly comprehending God, one in faith, one from doubt. Yet I think both men resonated with David's heart cry, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. and That my soul knows very well. If, hypothetically, both were guests on a roundtable discussion, it would not surprise me that they enjoyed each other. David chose the Book of God, Darwin the Book of Nature. Both are valued sources of inquiry into truth, though I would assert more effective when the deeper insights of both are shared openly and honestly, doubts and all. At this point, I imagine you might be wondering why I'm spending so much time on Charles Darwin in a book whose principal focus is biblical study and spiritual practice. One of the reasons is this statement from Darwin. In the long history of humankind, and animal kind too, those who learn to collaborate and improvise most effectively have prevailed. That's one of the main ideas of this book. I think Darwin might have been far more amenable to the current evidence than many who defend what they choose to understand about his theory. Now another 
is to put feet on Jesus' teaching. He says, love your enemies. Now, by enemy, I mean in a much broader and more nuanced sense, someone who opposes or interferes with what matters to me. That could be the guy who cuts me off in traffic or the nemesis of all I hold dear and many things beyond and in between. As we will see, I think this is actually more of what Jesus had in mind. As I undertook this project, I made it a point to seek out people and ideas with whom I might profoundly disagree. My experience is, is confirmed some of my thinking, but it's also altered or expanded other ideas that I may have held. I've often found with many people who reject the Bible, when they're pressed about it, they admit they've never actually read it. So, I think I would be remiss and hypocritical by not reading what Darwin had to say about himself, for example, if I set out to comment on creation, civilization, culture, and man's nature in opposition to an understanding which he substantially fortified. Nor is it my intent to merely provide a critique of Darwinism or the man himself. It's clear that Darwin was a truly kind and sincere man. He was respected by his colleagues, whether they agreed with him or not. He was loved by his children and his wife, Emma. She and her children attended a Unitarian church. Charles didn't. Soon after their marriage, Emma wrote to him, While you, Charles, are acting conscientiously and sincerely wishing and trying to learn the truth, you cannot be wrong. She was concerned at the threat to faith from the, as she put it, the habit in scientific pursuits to believe nothing till it's proved. His custom of conscientious doubt as a state of inquiry rather than belief made him open both to nature and revelation. As a result, they remained open to each other. I admire this about him. Darwin postulated that all life followed a common descent from a single cell and that the agency guiding that process was a blind, mindless urge for survival. And he called it natural selection. And there are parts of his theory that are good science. Ironically, a fair amount of Darwin's theory was taken from studying animal breeders who had learned to select for desired qualities in their flocks and herds by mating individuals with qualities they thought would be more useful. Okay. He took this idea and applied it to the whole of nature. He proposed that the primary drive for survival, which in his mind seemed to dominate the natural order, was sufficient to explain how species changed over time and how some survived and others did not. Survival of the fittest, proposed by Herbert Spencer, made sense to him. But he looked the other way on that score. Now, perhaps confirmation bias was at work at that stage. It's worth noting that Darwin spent the 40 years after his journey with the HMS Beagle in seclusion in Down, a small village south of London, due to his poor health. It occurs to me that this seclusion may have been a factor in the formation of his thinking. And he had a profound aversion of public disputes and heated controversy. Probably due in part to his health, but I think perhaps because he was a genuinely kind person also. Now, here in his day, the orthodoxy at Cambridge was that everyone had to march in step with the dictates of the Anglican Church. I find it ironically amusing that today an evolutionist orthodoxy has replaced it. In his day, naturalists were unable to reconcile the variations found in nature with a strict biblical dictate that every species was uniquely formed by divine act. His work cracked open that hardened shell and allowed deeper inquiry to take place. It is clear he was not comfortable with the dogmatic institutional stance of his day. I suspect he would be equally uncomfortable with our current evolutionary dogma as well. There were some other facts which, 
Through no neglect on his part, Darwin was not aware. At the time he wrote his Origin of Species, the basic unit of all living things, the cell, was conceived of as a glob of something called protoplasm. It had two parts, a cell and a nucleus surrounded by a homogeneous gel called cytoplasm. It was further thought that this rudimentary structure of living material was subject to external forces that determined all of its characteristics and activities. Whether by the agency of creation or in the competition for survival. Thus, Darwin attempts to explain how species came about and how they changed over time in order to survive in a way that made perfect sense from that understanding. What Darwin didn't know was that the cell itself is a marvelously intricate and interdependent factory of biological processes and materials. A key big breakthrough came in 1953 when Watson and Crick were able to determine the chemical structure of DNA. What we then came to understand was that DNA was a highly sophisticated code providing instructions for thousands of coordinated operations within individual cells. In fact, even the simplest bacteria is a biological factory of nanomachines, proteins, and chemical compounds, actually more complex and efficient than the GM plant making cars. Life, it appears, did not occur from the outside in. Rather, it's been found to operate in predetermined and highly specific chemical processes even at the microscopic level of subcellular activity. It seems highly improbable that the instructions for all these processes are the result of mere random chance. Information science tells us the probabilities against it are in the range of 10 times 10 to the 164th power. A quick perspective on the absurdity of that number. Cosmologists estimate that the number of particles in the entire universe is 10 times 10 to the 64th power. Mathematicians have a, a designation for a number being absurd that's anything more than 10 times 10 to the 50th power. Anything beyond that, a mathematician would consider that an absurd number. The other assumption which he held, now coming under fire from emerging evidence, is the nature of the universe itself. This debate isn't new. The Greeks were having it 2,500 years ago. Most in, most, and most influential on Western civilization, Plato and Aristotle. Now, Aristotle believed that the universe always existed with all the laws of nature and material processes established. Somehow. It had no beginning or end. Plato, in contrast, believed that existence sprang from mind, from ideas. Plato believed it this way, that there exists an immaterial universe of forms, perfect aspects of everyday things such as a table, bird, and ideas and emotions, joy, action, etc. The objects and ideas in our material world are shadows of the forms. He also taught that this world of ideas is more real in the material world which reflects it. Aristotle argued that the world must have existed from eternity, that everything that comes into existence did so from a substratum. Now, this assumption is self-contradictory. Aristotle argued matter must be eternal. I would interject at this point that eternity is not finite amounts of time. Rather, it is existence outside of the time-space continuum. The relevance of this will become clearer when we look at the nature of the kingdom of God that Jesus declared was at hand. 
Darwin assumed that the same natural laws and processes that operate in our present-day scientific observations have always operated and apply throughout the cosmos. This is called uniformitarianism. It, in short, it proposes that everything that is, always was, and continues to operate in the same way everywhere in the universe. Since he could not actually observe these past events, Darwin inferred the process by which they occurred. At the time Origin was published, many contemporaries, such as John Stuart Mills, found his conclusions conjectural. It could be argued that Darwin's summary of his evidence doesn't actually prove his theory. Darwin chose to follow the thinking of Charles Lyell, who was one of the foremost geologists of his time, who argued that to explain the past, the present is the best predictor. Thus, Darwin's conclusions assumed the current processes he observed had always been in operation in the same way. Again, as we started out, the rock and roll version of this would be same as it ever was. Back to the talking heads. Uh, you know, you get any two scientists together, you get three opinions. There you go. Uh, same as it ever was. The Big Bang, on the other hand, postulates that the universe had a clear and cataclysmic beginning and that eventually it will end. In 19... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, jumping a little bit ahead here. During the first half of the 20th century, there was considerable debate surrounding two opposite explanations of the nature of the universe, the steady state theory and the Big Bang. Now, the steady state theory does tend to follow the empiricism of Aristotle and others who restricted themselves to, the, to only what could be seen, tested, and proved. It proposes that the universe has been exactly the same and will never change. The Big Bang, on the other hand, postulates that the universe had a clear and cataclysmic beginning and that eventually it will end. In 1929, Edward Hubble proved that the universe was in fact expanding. The debate raged on until 1964 when radio astronomers Penzias and Wilson stumbled on cosmic microwave background radiation which allowed scientists to gather data about the early stages of the universe following the Big Bang. Since then, evidence for the Big Bang seems to have tipped the scales in this controversy, and science has pretty much abandoned the steady-state theory. And both theories have multiple variants, but here is the crux of the matter is really simple. Either everything that always was, or either rather, everything that is, always was, or it had a beginning. It's really Aristotle and Plato restated with mountains of research to puzzle over. Darwin, in developing his ideas, did not address the matter of origin. In his own words, the mystery of the beginning of all things is insoluble by us, and I, for one, must be content to remain an agnostic. He planted his flag on the mountain of his own theory, for all practical purposes, dodging the origin question. And, but like Aristotle before him, he recognized a first cause, but he couldn't overcome his reliance on what he could see and prove. But he couldn't ignore it either, and it bothered him. Superstring theory posits that there are ten dimensions in the universe. Our senses allow us direct experience with four. The three dimensions of space, up and down, right and left, back and forth, and time, which Einstein proved has physical properties relative to location and speed. The other six, and I can almost hear Plato chuckling, I told you so, we cannot directly experience, but it is likely they affect us in ways we have yet to understand. Now, I find it fascinating that a medieval rabbi, Nachmadanes, came to that same conclusion nearly 800 years ago, studying the first chapter of Genesis. That is that there were ten dimensions, four that we can experience, six that we can't. 
The first line of Genesis announces, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I think, at the very least, we can all admit that we are here. Current science points to the understanding that there was a beginning. Whether that was the agency of an intelligent designer or other forces we know not of, that can't be stated conclusively in scientific terms at this juncture. Honest men, like Darwin, who grappled with this, tend to recognize that there is much that is yet beyond our understanding. I think, for this reason, the willingness to wrestle with these questions together is more important than ever. AA's second tradition captures this approach quite well. Actually, you probably want to include the first tradition, which says personal recovery depends on group unity, but then for our group purpose, there's but one ultimate authority, a loving God, as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. Anyone who's been through that knows everybody listens to everybody else, and you come to a decision to, to move forward at, at a particular moment in time. And that is one of the keys to this book. As I mentioned at the start, I would say, as the psalmist, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. This actually becomes particularly important, as God is portrayed as having spoken things into existence. I'm going to elaborate more on this in the next chapter, in the next couple chapters. But I hope you'll mull over this. The information that resides in our DNA and of every other living thing could be understood as a language and therefore a form of speech. As Psalm 19 states metaphorically, allowing that God does not speak in exactly the same manner as we do, what if God's speech is the dizzyingly complex instructions that underlie quite literally everything but which, as information science points out, has no mass and therefore is not material at all, but is perceived in material mediums such as living beings. If the Bible is a reliable account in the matter of agency and authorship, then the why we are here ought to be plainly found there as well. Be fruitful. Multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. I believe this fourfold mandate puts human civilization into a context which, up until I began this book, I had actually.